Hello, everyone, and welcome to af excuse me afternoon at the museum. And that is an auspicious way to start. I'm all choked up already. This is Janine Stanley Iris, Explorer Community Manager, and I would love to welcome you today to our afternoon at the museum. Now, some of you came here thinking baseball. Yes, we're going to talk baseball. Well, we have a surprise for you today because the uh, baseball museum, the Negro Baseball League Museum in Kansas City is doing some renovation of their website and their virtual exhibits. And so they didn't have a lot of content for us yet, but they said, hey, can we come on afternoon at the museum with some of our staff to do your show at the end of October? And we said, well, of course you can. And so look forward to that show coming up. But today we have a very special show for you. We, we said, well, what can we do? And then we looked at the news. And in honor of the late Supreme Court Justice, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who stood for civil rights on so many levels, we today are taking a look at the National Civil Rights Museum. And to do that, we have our host, Stephanie Watts. Hi, Stephanie. Hi, Janine. Hi, Ryan. Okay. And we also have a guest today, Paul Mims. So uh, Stephanie has invited a guest to be with us at the museum today. Hi, Paul. Hello, everyone. And we have our agent of the day with us today, Mr. Caleb Thomas. Hi, Caleb. Hey, everybody. Well, I am going to step away and leave you all to your afternoon at the museum. Good afternoon, everyone. Again, I'm Stephanie Watts with my new found friend, Paul Mims. And uh, we're going to walk through virtually our um, National Civil Rights Museum um, in Memphis, Tennessee, um, as I understand it. Part of this museum is the former Lorraine Motel, where Dr. King was assassinated in 1968. And so um, what we, part of, well, let me say this, part of the reason to um, invite Paul along is to, uh, among other things, share with um, someone who I've gotten to know well over the past week or so, um, just to share the experience and also share with the IRA Explorer community, as well as our guests uh, on Zoom and YouTube, that IRA um, can be used in this way, especially now in light of um, social distancing and uh, many of us are still doing stay at home orders or shelter in place orders. Um, you wanna visit with a friend and do something fun. Maybe your friend is across town, maybe your friend is in another state. Um, you can connect through IRA, um, and today, of course, we're on YouTube live streaming, um, but there's other ways to connect as explorers, and you can share these experiences together. So uh, Paul and I will be sharing this with our wonderful agent, Caleb, um, who will move us through the museum. So Caleb, where are we? Are we at the front door of the museum? Uh, uh, so when we first get onto the civil rights museum.org website um it's got a uh a rotating uh carousel of pictures there's three pictures that it goes between uh the first picture uh that's on right now is a picture of the lorraine uh hotel it's got a room 306 and there's a room in front of it uh and that has a link that lead that is titled this is the history behind the movement slavery separate but equal boycotts ass assassinations black power this is the history of the uprising that pushed the national inter international civil rights forward and there's a link to uh no more the next picture is a picture of a memorial it looks looks like three big granite or um three big black pillars that have uh, relief carvings, uh, carved in of, of many different, uh, many different, different figures kind of all, uh, all telling one story. It's, it's kind of hard to tell from right here, but it, it, it appears that that, that sculpture is, is at the, the front of the museum. Um, it looks like it's a big entry, but very big focal point. 
Um, and it says museum events, the reawakening, exciting events, extraordinary speakers and special guests turn civil rights history into a one of a kind museum experience. Then you can click there and they've got their full calendar of events for for the upcoming upcoming year and beyond and they also have on there because i was checking out earlier they have a bunch of videos uh from past events that they've done mm, okay. then the third picture third main slide there is a picture of a group of uh, men and women uh they all uh, it's uh, black men and women they all have like sandwich board signs on that say i am a man in big bold letters mm. And that link says, this is the story of a people, of hopes and dreams, of challenge and change. It is an American story. This story, oh, sorry. this story and struggle that started many centuries ago continues today with you. Experience the story. And then you click, click that. That is the, uh, the link that has the majority of the kind of online exhibits. There's some videos and stuff like that, but uh, we, can, we can go to any of those pages that you would like, or I can continue describing this, this first page. Mm -hmm. Well, at this point, Paul, do you, um, you have any thoughts about how uh, we yeah, might like I, to walk into? Yeah, I, I guess. Um... You know, I, when I looked at it the first time, I, I found some things that, you know, of course I would like to see, but I won't be able to, but I would at least like to visit, you mm -hmm. know, at least for the experience of knowing that that's there. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how far away we are from some of those, but I guess I can just say that um, one thing I don't possess anymore is, is real youth. And so I was alive when Martin Luther King got killed. And in fact, I was serving in Vietnam when he got killed. Mm -hmm. And when I flew back home um, after my oh, eye injury, they flew me back to Naval Hospital Memphis. Mm. So I actually you know, went over to that area, not really knowing where it was because all the hoopla died in August by, of what had happened in April. But mm -hmm. um, you know, I figured out why everything was boarded off and why you couldn't get close to the jail and all that. Yes. So, you know, um, this kind of brings back a, a few memories from back when I could see and actually was in Memphis. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I will just say that for right now. But um, mm -hmm. there, there, there's a couple of things that I saw that I think are, uh, I guess, I guess they're, um, indicative of what we're talking about and where we're visiting and the history that we're trying to experience, you know, mm -hmm. virtually and remotely. And um, it just struck me like hit me in the back of the head. And that was uh, mm -hmm. one of the displays and maybe Caleb can find it, but there were some uh, uh, dipping cups or spoons and what they were is um you know that there are two of them and one of them has a w on it and one has a c on it and the w was the ones that white workers would use to dump into the communal water bucket and the c was for blacks or colored or whatever mm -hmm. to use mm -hmm. and so yeah, i understand germs weren't as big a thing back then and water was the universal cleanser mm -hmm. and so they didn't think anything about dipping both the spoons into the same water but they didn't want uh the black man's lips to touch the same spoon as the white man's lips and that's mm -hmm. how far it went something that trivial that minuscule was actually very important back then to try to draw the line and put us you know if if you can't see, I'm African American, so put us in our place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know that might be a good place for you, Caleb, to share if we've got exhibits um, from what little I've learned about the museum in, in the past couple of days. Because I took an opportunity to go on the website, I understand there are some different exhibits, and I don't know if what Paul has mentioned is within one of the exhibits 
Um, but maybe a good place to start because we are talking about civil rights and um, Martin Luther King Jr., of course, um, is civil rights leader. Uh, and of course, we know there were many other to incense Dr. King, um, but is there a list of exhibits? Um, is his perhaps one of them? In, in a... uh, there, there is a list of exhibits. I was able to find the water dibbit or oh. water dipper uh, exhibit that, oh. that Paul mentioned. Um, yeah. If you like, I can I can read through that. It's just a short little article. Please do. Uh, yes, it's got cool. it's got two pictures. Paul, you described them perfectly. It looks like like two two measuring cups with a long long handle on them. Uh, one has a W, one has a C. Uh, it says Jim, Jim Crow restrictions separated the races in America in every aspect of public life. Restaurant, buses, trains, restrooms, theaters, water fountains, and workplaces posted white only and colored only signs to remind people of their place. These water dip dippers, circa 1940, were donated to the Civil Rights Museum in the memory of R.L. Bryant by Jim Gatling and Beverly O'Brien Gilton. They were found on the property of the Arkansas Pro Plumbing Company owned by Ralph Leverett O'Brien. When the employees worked outdoors during the hot Arkansas summers, they used the dippers to scoop water out of the communal water bucket. At first glance, these brown rusted ladles look unexceptional except for one interesting feature, the hand, painting letter, hand painted letter on the back of each. One dipper is marked with W for whites and the other C for color. Even though the dippers were for the same buckets, the influence of the Jim Crow segregation seeped so deeply into the lives of Southerners that drinking from the same implement was anathema. The water dippers are part of our education collection and are a provocative example of the way in which Jim Crow laws subjected African Americans to racial discrimination in their daily lives. Since the museum received them in 1998, hundreds of schools, school children have viewed this artifact and have learned how even the simplest item can speak volumes about the history of inequality of America. Yeah. Thank you, Caleb. Thank you. No and there are other pictures in that particular group, I assume? Uh, that one, I, I, I was able to find that one through a through a search search um, mm -hmm. query for for the water dippers. I'm going to go back. They have a there's a tab on the site called exhibitions mm -hmm. um, and they've got several different ones. Um, we can we can continue down whichever avenue you guys want. They have them broken up uh, in like in, in year ranges. Uh, the first one is 1619 through 1861, mm -hmm. a culture of resistance, slavery in America. Then you have stand up by sitting down, student sit-ins, 1960. The year they walked, Montgomery bus boycott, 1955 to 1956. Mm -hmm. We are prepared to die. The freedom rides of 1961, and then what do we want? And that is an exhibit on Black Power. It does not have a date range. Mm -hmm. no. um, well, let's begin at the beginning, 1619. All right. Shall we? I wasn't around then, though. <laughs> <laughs> You hadn't quite arrived yet, Paul? No, not yet, not yet. <laughs> All right, it says, this exhibit offers a graphic representation of the global impact of slavery. Entering the circular gallery, visitors walk on a floor map of North and South America, Europe, and Africa. Illuminated channels provide statistics and information about the Atlantic slave trade, including the massive number of people captured, goods cultivated, and wealth created. And then they've got a picture of the... Uh, the entry room there that they mentioned, it is a, a large round room uh, there. In the first picture, you can see two large projection screens that they, they have different information projected in the center of the screen is a statue. The statue consists of a wooden wooden platform, like a step platform mm -hmm. on the top of the platform is a is a, a black woman holding her baby. And then on the uh, on the ground with one foot kind of on the first step leading up to the platform is a is a uh, is a white man with a beard holding his arm out towards the woman. Hmm. Um, there's a sign that says a culture of slavery, a culture of resistance, slavery in America, 1619 through 1861. It's an info panel that stands behind them. Uh, the other photo that they have illustrated here is a 
photo of there are five five men that are are shackled and and bound and the the way they are pr- placed they're, they're sculptures they look look to be made of, of of some kind of of metal and they're positioned against the wall but the wall has a uh the wall is is wooden up until about the chest high level mm-hmm. um and then from that level up is a painting and that painting is of the the uh, upper deck of a of a ship of a slave ship. There's several several men in in like kind of white flowy shirts that are um, escorting, kind of pushing and leading around men in shackles and kind of loin cloths. So the effect it, it gives the effect that the statues are kind of below deck while all of that is happening above. And just just for. Um my better understanding of shackles can you describe exactly what they look like i'm i'm thinking they're made of iron or some sort of metal and, yeah sure thanks so the uh the the shackles of the of the people of the statues the people that are actually like below the mm-hmm. boat they're in the, in the image, at least, I can't see any shackles like on the on the arms and wrists. They appear to only be shackled around the feet, and they it it looks yeah it looks like metal like iron. Um, the shackle is basically it's two U shaped pieces of of metal that kind of go over the um, over the front over the like the ankle shin area. It goes over there, and it goes behind the the ankle where there is a a hole on either end of the u that a rod slides through that kind of like the rod looks like it goes through both of the the u's for each feet so one one rod would secure both feet Mm, i see that makes sense but the in the photo there they have different shackles on they are they are shackled it it's it's hard to tell because it's 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 kind of a um, little bit of a stylistic painting style, um, but it looks it looks more like they they are roped, you know, because it looks like their arms definitely are bound, and it looks as if they are bound like the arms are bound to the to the neck as well, and they there aren't as evident feet bindings in the in the painting of above deck there mm-hmm. and i just want to point out quickly before we move to another um either another painting or exhibit that uh for the ira explorers uh and our guests um, this is the kind of detail that we're we're fortunate to get um as we use the ira service to participate in something like a virtual mu- museum tour um, if you go, of course, in person um, and you are on a docent led tour, you know, I'm sure the docents speak and articulate what's going on in this time period. But these are the kind of visual interpretations that help us as blind people to really absorb and enjoy the experience, N- not, not per se to enjoy th- their experience with shackles, but to really absorb uh, what these pictures tell us in a, you know, pictures are worth a thousand words. So we literally have Ira to give us those several of those words uh, out of the thousand. Okay. So thank you for that yeah, very yeah. Um, explicit um, description, Caleb. And I, I would add that uh, what Ira gives us, as many of you know, are the details and even though the docents might take us along on, on a, a, a live tour or even a virtual tour, they probably won't get those details like our IRA agents do. We've actually trained those IRA agents by our experience and by our questions and, and the like to focus on those details and, and understand how important those details are right. Yeah, right. to us. Exactly. And so they, they basically fill in the blanks in the pictures for us. Exactly. Because I honestly never knew what that shackle looked like. 
all the years of hearing about people being shackled, never knew and, until just now. So, okay. Are there any other pictures in this particular exhibit, Kayla? Yeah, so, so that one, um, it looks, Okay, no, no. So, so they've just kind of got like kind of brief overviews of the okay. different um, sections of it. Um, so, yeah, so that first one is a culture of resistance. The next uh, exhibit is the rise of Jim Crow. Um, I can Let's go through that one that. if you like. Yeah. Oh, Caleb, it, Caleb? Yes, it, sir. One thing that, that I saw that was mentioned on there, they actually have a slave shack. Oh, okay as part of the display i can find it and um i think it was donated by someone who you know actually was in doll houses or something but it, it, it's complete with you know furnishings figurines and the whole bit so paul when you say a slave shack would that be when it, what they would have considered a cabin back then or yeah it might be a slave cabin but yeah uh -huh. yeah yeah but basically it, yeah, it was not, it was not, nothing yeah. like a mansion <laughs> no well, no, <laughs> but I, I would be curious to see that because again, it, it helps to frame history right. in a way that is personal. When you see where people live and what they're living with, I mean, I, I understand that there were dirt floors. Mm -hmm. I think we got that much figured out um, from various movies and period pieces, but what, yeah, if you're able to find that, Caleb, I think I, that's- I've I've got it. Yeah, it's a um, model slave cabin. It says among the interestingly novel artifacts in the National Civil Rights yeah, Museum collection right is a model slave cabin donated to the museum oh along with figurines, furniture, and accessories. It was fashioned by the well-regarded dollhouse enthusiast yeah, Jacqueline really Andrews of Ashland, Virginia. In mm -hmm. 1975, Barbara Gray commissioned Miss Andrew to create these dolls and the house. It was purchased by the Weaver family in 2004, who then donated it to the museum. The miniature slave cabin is made of wood, contains two room and a loft, and is one and a half stories high. It is also elevated on wooden blocks in order to appear to have a crawl space, which was a common architectural, architectural feature of slave dwellings. Slave mm -hmm. cabins were often made of logs, making them easy to build and economical for plantation owners who were looking for cheap housing options. A cabin's lofted a cabin's loft served as a storage or sleeping space. Cabins had fireplaces for heating and cooking, but otherwise were minimally furnished. Depending on the wealth of the plantation owner and the status of the slave within a plantation, cabins were varied in terms of amenities and levels of comfort. Typically, a slave cabin such as this would be situated some distance from the plantation owner's house. It was not uncommon for a single cabin to house multiple families if needed. Andrew's model cabin was meant to depict the life of slaves in a typical 19th century cotton plantation. Slaves living in these sorts of cabins labored in the fields and spent the bulk of the harvest season picking the daily quota of cotton the overseer demanded. Often this required working in the hot sun over 12 hours a day. Andrew also created a household scene within the model dollhouse. She added furniture and household goods that a family might use to create some sense of a comfortable home. One of the most creative elements of the dollhouse are the dolls themselves. Andrew includes a total of 10 nuthead dolls made in the style of black, black Americana folk art tradition. Their heads are made of walnuts and their faces, while simplistic, are hand painted. Their bodies are made using a variety of materials, wood, wire, corn husk, and in some cases, stiff cardboard. Each doll is unique. Andrews made these dolls to depict black life and the dignity of black people living in this time period. This model slave cabin was donated to the museum by Kimberly and jo Gregory Weaver in honor of their parents, Christina and Isaiah Weaver. The museum had solicited this donation as part of its collection plan for its 2014 renovation of the Lorraine building. I had the pleasure of meeting Miss Christina Weaver while she visited Memphis earlier this year. She was accompanied by a group of friends and they all came into the collections climate controlled vault to look at the model slave cabin. In my conversations with Christina Weaver, I learned about her marriage to her late husband, Ike, and their courtship and romance. Christina came to the United States from England in the 1960s, and she and Ike were co-workers at a local hospital. 
They married after the passing of the landmark federal case Loving versus Virginia in 1967, which overturned the ban on interracial marriages. Mm -hmm. This is the first time that the model slave cabin has been publicly displayed. We thank the Weaver family for donating this unique artifact to our museum. If you have any item that you would like to offer the National Civil Rights Museum as regards to collection, please contact Rika Nandi. And then they've got three pictures here on the, on the site. The first one is a uh, front facing picture of the cabin. Uh, it, as it mentioned in the description, it is raised up off the ground slightly um, to kind of create a crawl, crawl space. Um, I think it, the article did a pretty good job of explaining it, but if you guys had any, any questions about the, uh, that details that you want to fill, fill in like this has a little porch that mm -hmm. has like some rough hewn pillars um, holding it up um, all of the all of the logs that uh, make up the the cabin itself all are like very rough hewn they appear to still have like bark on them you know they're just kind of rounded just just mm -hmm. stacked up um, very simple rectangular windows cut into it a doorway doesn't have a door it doesn't look like mm -hmm. then right. yeah and then on the inside they've got the little little dolls and in 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 chairs like the first room just kind of has a chair and there's two dolls sitting in it and then the second room is just just a little bedroom and the bed mm -hmm. has has like kind of a patchwork quilt mm -hmm. uh, on it so sparsely furnished bed chairs. Um, I think it's a fireplace and however they're clipped. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm guessing probably maybe 600 square feet. And it may not say, but it doesn't sound like a lot of space. And maybe with be enough space for in today's you know, way we live, maybe one or two people at the most and perhaps a baby, but if you're putting a lot of families or at least more than one family in that space, um, the crowding could be, um, well, you yeah. know, they, they lived how they had to live, but not ideal. Let's just say not ideal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Thank you, Caleb. Thank you. Description. Cool. Yeah. Um, so that exhibit is the uh, the the first one I think the resistance or maybe that that's uh, a different exhibit. Um, that, was, that was another one that I found oh, through, that's right. yeah. through the search um, mm -hmm. because it looks it looks like they they have a uh, kind of actually it looks like these these might be be their their kind of blog post because they have it broken mm -hmm. down going back to December 2017. So it looks like those are those are each posts from their from their blog that right. uh, will showcase specific mm -hmm. exhibits. And, that, and that's where I actually found those. Yeah. Reading the blog. Right. Again, another cool feature of IRA that we can be in these museums either in person or virtually and ask the agent um, once we're in, you know, touring um, to to uh, perhaps pull up something in Google or elsewhere. Uh, if you're walking through by yourself or with a group of friends, those that led tour or self self-guided tour, again, that's one of the benefits. Um, so Paul, if you're okay with it, um, can we take a look at the Jim Crow? Go ahead, go ahead. All right, it says, I too am America. Combating Jim Crow, 1896 through 1954. Visitors may review the timeline of amendments and legislation that granted rights to African Americans, followed by the sequence of laws and Supreme Court decisions that struck down these gains and established separate but equal as the law of the land. Through historic photographs and legal texts, visitor, visitors see the vibrancy of the black community despite segregation. Oral history, histories provide first person accounts about life under Jim Crow. And they've got a couple photos there, like the uh, banner photo is just kind of a wide shot of the exhibits. Uh, it's got the, it's got the uh, I2M America 
title um, mm-hmm. there. And they've got, it looks like a video that plays next to it. Uh, on the video screen, there is a picture of, of black school children. It says, books shall not be interchangeable between the white and colored schools, North mm-hmm. Carolina. And then there's a father and son watching the video, it looks like. Uh, and then there is kind of going around uh, past the, the video, like, like so if you were standing looking at the I2 America uh, sign and kind of slowly started rotating uh, mm-hmm. clockwise, you'd hit the video. Then there is uh, a section titled Church. And there's several artifacts there. There's a, a section titled Homes and Land. And there's several artifacts and, and timelines and stuff listed there. Mm-hmm. Education, stuff there. And then the last one that I can see in this photo is Black Press. And mm-hmm. I, it doesn't really have a lot of information on, on the exhibits on, on this page. It's more of kind of a, an overview of that, that little section a little nook of the museum but um but yeah so that's kind of the well you know i personally um am curious to know if there's any like a a quick search in google perhaps anything that says um how jim crow started or or um something just quick that can um kind of help put the perspective. Um, so Paul, since you weren't around in 1619 nor 1896, <laughs> but you might have a, a best guess. <laughs> well, I was, only, I was only born in 1945. Right. I, yeah. <laughs> I knew nothing about you know, Rosa Parks by the time I was nine. So, right. um, but, yeah. um, and actually I lived in Iowa, which was the last, I think museum that we visited, and of course I didn't know that museum was there, and I know there there really weren't that many black people that I knew of that were there. Mm-hmm. But uh, given that, you know, uh, in the 1950s and 60s in in Iowa, I I didn't really experience that mm-hmm. uh, level of discrimination. And again, this is more prevalent in the South. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, the Jim Crow South was uh, instituted to, um, of course, keep segregation alive and well. Um, I'm going to assume after Reconstruction, so civil rights, um, I mean, um, Civil War ended, Reconstruction occurred. I mean, this is just a big general overview. And then Jim Crow laws in the South instituted to um, go push people back uh, to a time era gone by um, and to ensure that economic prosperity wasn't a possibility for them. I I think that's fair to say about overall Jim Crow. Um, So Caleb, did you find anything that you can share? Yeah, I found a couple. I was trying to find something a little more a little more brief, but I did mm-hmm. find find one here. Uh, it's from uh, University of South Carolina School of Law. Um, it says, Jim Crow has long been a derogatory sl- slang term for a black man, making it a fitting name for the laws that were in force in the South and some border states from 1877 through the mid-1960s. Mm-hmm. These laws were in place to maintain racial segregation after the Civil War ended. Initially, Jim Crow laws required the separation of white people and people of color on all forms of public transportation and in schools. Eventually, the segregation expanded to include interaction and commingling in schools, cemeteries, parks, theaters, and restaurants. Often, anyone who was suspected of having a black ancestor, even just one in the very distant past, was considered to be a person of color and therefore subject to the Jim Crow laws. The overarching purpose of the Jim Crow law was to prevent contact between black people and white people as equals, establishing white people as above black people. 
Jim Crow laws began in 1877 when the Supreme Court ruled that states couldn't prohibit segregation on common modes of transportation, such as trains, streetcars, and riverboats. Later in 1883, the Supreme Court overturned specific parts of the Civil Rights Act of 1875, confirming the separate but equal concept. During the ensuing years, states passed laws instituting instituting requirements for separate and equal accommodations for blacks on public modes of transportation. Black people also had separate schools, hospitals, churches, cemeteries, restrooms, and prisons. And these facilities were usually inferior to facilities for white people, although the laws called for the separate facilities to be of equal quality. Jim Crow laws also influenced social interactions between blacks and whites. Failure to enforce these laws resulted in fines or imprisonment. Into the 20th century, Jim Crow laws continued to govern everyday life in America, prohibiting black and white interaction. For instance, in the state of Georgia, blacks and whites had to use separate parks. Blacks and whites could not play checkers together in Birmingham, Alabama under a 1930 law. And in 1935, blacks and whites were forbidden from boating together in Oklahoma. Blacks who violated these laws could be physically beaten by whites without reprisal. Lynchings occurred with startling frequency when blacks violated Jim Crow laws. When World War II erupted and the United States entered the conflict, Jim Crow laws were still in force. Racial segregation was an integral part of society in some parts of the country, and so black men who served in the military were assigned to segregated divisions. Black servicemen were given lesser support positions, such as grave digging or cooking, and they were served food in separate lines from white servicemen. At first, black servicemen did not engage in combat, but as the war went on, increasing numbers were placed in frontline positions where they served with distinction. After World War II ended, America's segregation policies were put under the microscope. President Harry Truman created a committee to investigate the issue, and in 1948, Truman issued an executive order that eliminated racial discrimination in all of the military branches. The tide began to turn noticeably towards equality in the following years with a series of Supreme Court victories for civil rights. Black people finally began breaking down racial barriers and challenging segregation with success. And the pinnacle of this effort was the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which, which abolished the Jim, Crow's law, Jim Crow laws. The laws outlawed discrimination in any type of public accommodation. In 1965, the Voting Rights Act followed, which protected black, black people's rights to vote by barring discriminatory voting laws. Oh, Lordy, is that relevant? And here we are. <laughs> How relevant is that today? Voting yeah. Rights Act, Civil Rights Act, Supreme Court Justice, may she rest in peace. Um, yeah. Passing and uh, fighting for our civil rights. Um, okay. And John Lewis, who, you know, we recently funeralized, had a big part, you know, starting back then. Right. In the 60s and coming forward till. Right. you know, a month and a half ago. Well, in fact, Caleb, um, is there any piece um, or picture or artifact here in the museum that um, speaks about John Lewis? Um, I'm not sure he was a freedom writer, but he certainly uh, he, well. He was, he was involved in the marches. Right. Yeah. He was. And yeah, here's that, here. And that part about we'd you know, we'll die if we have to. Yeah. Okay. Here's a here's an article from from their blog, John Lewis Freedom Writer. Mm -hmm. And, says, and before, you, before you start also, if you can share um, uh, after the article, any kind of pictures or artifacts that maybe we can have descriptions of um, if, if there are any. Yeah, sure thing. Yeah, this mm -hmm. one's just got, it's got two photos there. Um, mm -hmm. It says, in a 1961 strategy meeting, members of the Congress of Racial Equality and the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, committee gather in Alabama to discuss their next moves. Key among them is a young activist named John Lewis, a member of SNCC who had been attacked by the Ku Klux Klan in Rock Hill, South Carolina, mere days before this photograph. And there's a photo there of, there's just, there's several men, they're kind of, uh, all sitting on on the floor you know they're just haphazard it's like there's five or six um one in the front has kind of has his hand up towards towards the towards the camera um mm -hmm. there definitely appears like the the photo gives the feeling of like 
intense discussion, conversation, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. rolling over ideas. It continues. The Freedom Rides were a critical moment in Lewis's career, but they were not his first or last demonstration during the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. Lewis organized sit-in demonstrations with the Nashville student movement at lunch counters across Nashville, Tennessee, while attending Fisk University in 1960 and was integral in the creation of SNCC later that year. Mm -hmm. After the Freedom Rides, Lewis spent the next years of his life dedicated to nonviolent change, becoming SNCC chairman in 1961 and once again putting his life in danger in Selma in 1965. Congressman John Lewis has represented Georgia's 5th District since 1986 and continues to advocate for what he calls good good trouble. We would like to thank the anonymous donor, donor of Bruce Davidson photographs. If you have an item that you would like to offer the National Civil Rights Museum as we grow our collection, please contact me. Uh, the second photo, it looks like it looks like the a photo from the same same meeting if not a not a similar Mm -hmm. like um they're they're all sitting on on the ground except there's there's one older gentleman in uh slacks and a tie that is is sitting in in the chair uh Mm -hmm. in a chair kind of while all the the younger younger people are kind of around him there's also a stairway in the background that has a a woman that is sitting on the stairs kind of watching mm-hmm. everything unfold. And that's We're kind, kind of, of capturing things in real life, the way we live yeah. with our camcorders or phone cameras and videos. Oh that's yeah, that, that, it, it definitely looks very, very, very modern. Like aside from the, the dress, it's, it's just kind of people, people mm-hmm. gathering. Mm-hmm. Hmm. okay yeah yeah it's um very poignant you know history repeats itself maybe or maybe we can learn some things from history we hope um i uh wonder if caleb if you can find a picture of the edmund pettus bridge and maybe describe it for us that's uh the bridge on which bloody sunday happened and Maybe there's some um, information to share. All right, let's see. All right, I found there lots of Wikipedia Mm -hmm. entry for it. All right, so I have the photo for it on, on the. Yeah, I'm just curious. I mean, I, you know, for for those who can see bridges, this bridge may not look any more remarkable than any other bridge, but I've never had a description of it. Yeah, so, so yeah, it it it, it actually is is a kind kind of interesting. So it's got, um. It's got like kind of like your 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 normal flat bridge, um, you know, like like walkway. It's got a uh, a railing that goes across it. There's two two large um, two sets of two pillars mm-hmm. in the in the water that seem to be the primary support uh, mechanisms for the the bridge across. What what kind of stands out? What's what's different about it is if it just had kind of had those pillars and the, and the flat top, it would be a normal bridge, but it has a, a, like a curving semicircle iron, um, iron structure that extends from underneath the road surface on the, on the, on the, uh, pillars on the pylons. Mm. And it goes up over the work, uh, road surface and then back down underneath the road surface to attach at the other at the other pillars the other pylons mm-hmm. so it's it's like um so looking at looking at the bridge from the side you would see like like the regular bridge and then there's there's a uh like a arcing semicircle over the the mm-hmm. top of the bridge so mm-hmm. so cars are actually driving under that that structure you're walking under that structure to go mm-hmm. you know across 
across the bed. Uh, and its color, is it a rust brown? Is it a beautiful golden gate gold? <laughs> the, so the the pillars, the pillars and the uh, and like the road way part that that appears to just be just like kind of concrete just mm -hmm. just bare bare concrete okay. Okay. um and then the the metal uh the metal arch is is like a just like a gray steel mm -hmm. so yeah like, nothing in terms of looks nothing really too remarkable but the history of the bridge and i understand um there's um effort to to change it to the john lewis bridge We'll see how how that goes, and uh, as we consider the times we're in in the current administration and Congress. So, Paul, what say you? Well, you know, it's you know we've we've come to where you know we're almost back home to me. I mean, it, we're at a point where you know it it uh, connected with my life finally. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, you know, I I have to say I, I I'm not a know-it-all, and I learned a lot. Not just a few things, but I feel like I learned a lot just by having the opportunity to go through this museum, if only through you know let website links and and reading some of the the um, uh, under the headings on the, on the blog. Mm -hmm. And so I know there are people that haven't been as close to this as I have in my own real life experiences. And so I know that there's something here for everybody that wants to learn. Yeah. And uh, yeah. there's something here that, you know, almost everybody, there's something that they didn't know. Mm -hmm. And very likely there's something that will if you open your mind, put some things in place for you. Yeah, I agree. And I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, um, you know, so many people like, like yourself, Stephanie said, you know, I really couldn't imagine how this was. Mm -hmm. And so this museum can help put it, you know, closer to reality. You know, some mm -hmm. of the harshness of the times from 1619 to Right now we're we're looking at 1964 and beyond, mm -hmm. and um, you know, and now we're here at 2020, and so we got another 56 years beyond that. And how much has changed, mm -hmm. and how little has changed, mm -hmm. and so this gives you a chance to view that behind your beside your own life experiences, mm -hmm. and examine for yourself how much or how little in your view, it's changed. And I know that there is a exhibit um, that features a Dr. King and in terms of time, I know we don't have a lot left. So Caleb, is there any um, pictures or artifacts within the Dr. King exhibit? And I think they call it 50 years that was in 19 in 2018 that was the 50 years oh that was the, that's right that was the 50 yeah. years and so there might be something in that exhibit group to share as we wind down and it it comes to mind too that for those who haven't ever gone to a museum for whatever reason like me years ago i thought well why would i go i can't see it um it comes to mind that there's so many many things that through use of the IRA service that we can participate in, again, and have a meaningful experience, not just I'm walking through, I'm listening to something be described. It's one thing to, for someone to say, well, there's a picture of two people standing in front of a building. It's another to hear the description of what the building is and the people standing in front of it. So I encourage anyone out there, um, IRA explorers and um, guests, family of friend and friends of people who use the IRA service, um, go to your local museums, um, either virtually, if, if you can't go in person, go virtually. There's a lot here. Yeah. So. Uh, Caleb, I, I, I don't know how the 
the the last few ones I I weren't I I wasn't part of them. But can you read off the main link to this museum? So it will yeah. be part of the record in the recording. Yeah, it is this. civilrightsmuseum.org. Okay. Mm -hmm. It is. And Stephanie, I was able to find find something pretty neat in the um, MLK section. And actually, they have a lot of interesting information on MLK and, and other things. But there's a, a whole lot of uh, video information they did. Uh, mm -hmm. remembering MLK 4420 and mm -hmm. they it, it's like a looks like a virtual conference you know celebration that they did and there's several different videos that mm -hmm. they have there but one of the things here that jumped out to me for for our purposes here today is there is a timeline that they have a timeline of the last seven days of MLK's life oh okay. oh wow yeah can you uh yeah. And so it kind of goes through and it's it's um, it, there's 35 images. Most of the images are text. It looks like they were kind of set up to go out over social media. Um, mm -hmm. The very first one is March 28th, 1968. It's titled King in Memphis. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. arrived in Memphis at 11 a.m. to lead a march for the sanitation workers strike. And then go into the next. There's a photo of of King surrounded by uh, several other other marchers. One one of the men um, behind him is kind of looking. Looks like he's like looking just past the camera at maybe another camera person, but has both of his hands on King's shoulders. King is kind of looking off to the way. He looks a little little distressed. Like he looks looks a little like you know. Mm. Yeah, but everyone around him seems to be pretty, pretty jovial, you know, mm -hmm. um, it says the march ended in looting and violence. Supporters quickly moved Dr. King into a car and rushed him to safety at the Holiday Inn Rivermont. Over 50 people were injured and hospitalized. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, and also see, there's a couple. Um, I, there's one sign that is is kind of visible in the uh, in the in the shot there. It says closed today, dot, dot, dot on the march exclamation point mm. okay. next is dated mm. march 28th 1968 hands up don't shoot an hour after the march ended an unarmed black teenager named larry payne was shot and killed by memphis police officers mm. hands up don't shoot <laughs> we'll hear a lot of that today <laughs> There's there's a photo of Larry Payne next, and it is a, a young man in a striped vest with a collar. He is sitting on a couch in front of a, a coffee table. He's just kind of casually sitting facing the camera. Mm -hmm. this normal young man. Mm -hmm. uh, March 28th, 1968, National Guard presence. That evening, Mayor Henry Loeb implemented martial law. March 29th, 1968, King and the media adamant that a nonviolent protest would work in Memphis. Dr. King gave a press conference from the Holiday Inn Rivermont. Mm -hmm. Then there is a picture of King uh, in front of several, like a, a stand of microphone, it says he then left Memphis promising the return. King is... Um, He's he's looking out at the reporters. He's got his hands up like, you know, he's, you know, looks a little uh, exasperated. Um, one of the things that kind of notes stands out to me is the 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 microphones. There's very they're, they're an old style, long, slender. Um, but you each one of them has the little medallion from their station. There's a, a 88. NBC Channel 7. I see the CBS I logo on one, ABC, and then there's one titled WINS. Mm. Mm. That's probably a local. Yeah. Like mm -hmm. uh, March 30th, 1968. Conflict in the crisis. After the failed march, SCLC leadership remained divided. Many believe the organization should focus on the upcoming Poor People's Campaign in Washington, D.C. King argued that success in D.C. hinged on the SCLC's continued support of the sanitation workers. He remained committed to Memphis and would return the following week. 
March 31st, 1968, King's Last Sermon. Dr. King delivered his final Sunday sermon at the Washington National Cathedral in Washington, D.C. The sermon covered economic justice for blacks in the U.S. There's a picture of King kind of mid, mid sermon. He's got his, his fist clenched and he's, he's kind of like, he looks like he's speaking forcefully. It says Dr. King delivered his final Sunday sermon at the Washington National Cathedral in Washington, D.C. The sermon was entitled Remaining Awake Through a Great Revolution and covered economic justice for blacks in the U.S. Mm-hmm. March 31st, 1968, Johnson declines re-election. President Lyndon B. Johnson announced he would neither seek nor accept the nomination for re-election in 1968. April 1st, 1968. City curfew. Memphis Mayor Loeb lifted the citywide 7 p.m. curfew. Next, there's a photo of um, two black men stretched across the uh, the trunk of a car. Uh, there are there are men in white suits uh, or white like white shirts all around. Some of them have looks like like military style helmets on. Others have uh, mm. looks like like a like a bobby cap, like a police officer has got the badge in the middle. I can see several of the people with white shirts have handcuffs on them. And um, at least one guy has a shotgun and one guy has just like a giant rod, just like a big like looks like four or five foot long piece of pipe. Wow. Uh, It says in 1968, Memphis Mayor Henry Loeb lifted the citywide 7 p.m. curfew after violence erupted during the march on March 28th. That included Dr. King supporting the strike sanitation workers. These two men are among many who were arrested in black neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. April 2nd, 1968, Larry Payne's funeral. Hundreds of mourners gathered at Claiborne Temple for the funeral of Larry Payne, the unarmed black teenager killed by Memphis police police on March 28th. The Reverend B.T. Dumas delivered his eulogy. On this day in 1968, hundreds of mourners attended the funeral of Claiborne Temple for Larry Payne, at at Claiborne Temple for Larry Payne. The unarmed black teenager cleared but killed by Memphis police on March 28th. After the march in support of sanitation workers erupted in violence, Payne was a junior at Mitchell Road High School. Mm. April 3rd, 1968, King returns to Memphis. 9 a.m., Dr. King, Reverend Ralph Abernathy, Andrew Young, Bernard Lee, and Dorothy Cotton boarded Eastern Airlines Flight 381 from Atlantis to Memphis. A bomb threat delays the plane's departure. April 3rd, 1968, 10.33 a.m., Dr. King and his associates arrived at Memphis International Airport's Gate 17. 11.20 11.20 a.m., Dr. King and associates arrived at the Lorraine Motel and were greeted by fellow SCLC members. Dr. King checked into room 306 of the Lorraine Motel. Mm-hmm. There is a picture of uh, King, Hosea Williams, Jesse Jackson, and Ralph Abernathy on the balcony of the Lorraine Motel in Memphis, the same place he stood the day he was assassinated. Dr. King checked into room 306 where he spent his last hours. And it's it's a picture. It's a it appears to be the same picture from the front page of the, of the website or the same, same room. Um, mm-hmm. It's a little bit more closed up, but yeah, you can, you can see the, uh, the four of them there. Jesse Jackson has a particularly kind of jovial smile on his face. He looks, he looks, looks happy. looks like, you know, um, and then so, so do the, the other men, although it's not as jovial King, however, looks distressed. Uh, April 3rd, 1968, 12.05 p.m., Dr. King and SCLC staff attended a strategy meeting at Centenary United Methodist Church, pastored by Reverend James Lawson. 2.48 p.m., Dr. King returned to the Lorraine Motel and was served an injunction in the motel's courtyard prohibiting the march plan for Monday, April 8th. 3 p.m., Dr. King and SCLC staff met with Memphis lawyers Lucius Birch, Walter Bailey, Mike Cody, and Charlie Newman in room 307. 4 p.m., Dr. King and the SCLC meet with the Invaders, a young black activist group, in room 307. 7 p.m., feeling ill. Dr. King sent Reverend Abernathy, Andrew Young, and Jesse Jackson to attend the mass rally at Mason Temple in his place. 
815, Abernathy, Jackson, and Young arrived at Mason Temple. Upon arrival, the crowd roared in anticipation of seeing Dr. King. Abernathy urged Dr. King to come to the temple. 930, Dr. King arrived at Mason Temple and delivered his final speech, I've been to the mountaintop. Mm -hmm. Mm. There's a, there, yes, mm -hmm. this is April 3rd. Um, there's another picture of, of King during the speech. He's mid speech. Um, he's not as kind of bombastic as in that last one. He seems much more um, kind of reserved, you know, at least in this, this photo. It says, feeling ill and not expecting a crowd, Dr. King gave his final and prophetic speech. I've been to the mountaintop at Mason Temple in Memphis. He spoke of a time when he almost died and his premonition, premonition, quote, I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but we as a people will get to the promised land. Mm -hmm. April 4th, 1968, 9.30 a.m. Andrew Young arrived at Memphis courtho Courthouse to con contest the injunction placed on the March plan for April 8th. April 4th, 1 p.m., Dr. King and Abernathy had the Lorraine Motel's famous catfish for lunch in room 306. 2 p.m., from, from room 201, Dr. King and his brother, A.D., called their mother in Atlanta. 4.30 p.m., Andrew Young returned to the Lorraine and announced the injunction had been lifted. Enthusiastic, the men had a pillow fight. <laughs> Didn't <know> that. Yeah. <laughs> 5.20 p.m., Dr. King and Reverend Ralph Abernathy head back to their rooms to dress for dinner at the home of Reverend Samuel Billy Kiles. 5.55 p.m., Dr. King walked out on the balcony and spoke with guests below in the courtyard, including Jesse Jackson, Ben Branch, and Solomon Jones. 6.01 p.m., a bullet struck Dr. King as he stood on the balcony of the Lorraine Motel outside of room 306. He was transported to St. Joseph's Hospital. 7.05 p.m., Dr. King was pronounced dead. And that is the end of the timeline. Yeah. I guess that's kind of coincident with the end of our timeline here. But, right. <laughs> uh, wow, that's, that's, that's mind-boggling. Yeah. You know, to be able to get back there and within that so vividly. Thank you, Caleb. Yes, thank you so much. And so many things you didn't know. I mean, yeah. uh, so many things that you learn that you just, you don't, you, you never, you never knew about. I mean, the, the detail that those go into, you know, I think about the food, the, the pillow fight even, um, it just it's goes to show that. a way to end. Yeah. 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 Just, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's very. We have to shake that one off, don't we? <clears throat> yeah. Well, yeah, it's um, it's the way, it's it's just the um, symmetry uh, of history now. Um, yeah. Well, I like. We've been there, done that, and we're doing it again. Exactly, and that's what I was going to say. I'd like to take a few minutes, and we can run over here a little bit, folks. So, stick with us because we want to kind of discuss this we um we had a lot of time to talk about it prior to this call between um all of us and i kind of wanted to hear from paul and stephanie particularly um so you know so much of what i just heard over the past hour is still going on i mean my mm -hmm. goodness um hands up don't mm -hmm. shoot i had no idea that that was a slogan back then yeah. or it's something that people said no idea. Yeah. And the so, black activists that met with Dr. King, I was wondering, are, would that be the precursor to Black Lives Matter? You know, I mean, we heard about yeah. the Black Panthers, but these, the particular name, um, forgive me, I don't recall, but um, Caleb read it in the timeline. And so activism has been going on since 16, probably since 1619, when yeah. the ship landed, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah. And so. So. They were called the invaders. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like the invaders. Invaders. And they're one that I had not heard of, but I'm mm -hmm. sure there were probably many groups like that around at mm -hmm. the time. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, 
you know, when we kind of look around us and we think, oh, well, that was history and wow, that was interesting. But yet it turns out that we know people who have been affected by these things. And Paul, you had an interesting story about when you were in high school. Can you tell everybody that story? Because it's really, it really affected me in that, wow, somebody that I know very well um, was, was subjected to some of these Jim Crow laws and some of the things that went on at that time. Talking about the night after the track meet? Yep. (laughs) Yep. Okay. Yeah, I, um, well, I ran track in high school, and in 1963, our high school won the indoor state track meet. So we were state champs in, in the indoor track. In 1959, our high school was mostly white. By 1963, there were 12 white students left. So it definitely was a transition period for the high school and for, of course, just the whole community around that school. And after the track meet, I was walking home and uh, this cop car pulls up, you know, where you going, boy? Okay, of course, that's, you know. And I said, home, where you been? Um, I'm just leaving the high school. School's been out for a long time. What do, you, what do you mean? I said, well, you know, our high school track team just got back. We, went, we, we won the state indoor track meet. And so we're state champs. And, and so I was just walking home afterward because we just got back. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. Okay. And um, so can you show me some ID? Do you have a driver's license? I said, no. Yeah, I thought to myself, if I had a driver's license, I wouldn't be walking. But, you know, I showed him my school ID. And, you know, they went through the whole rigmarole. And, um, you know, so at that point, you know, I was 18. Yeah, I just turned 18, but I got put in the system. Mm -hmm. And so um, that was the racial profile. We want to identify all black men so that we know who they are when we run up against them again and know Mm -hmm. that we've seen them before. And so... I, I um, it, it was just, I, I, I can't say what my emotions were, you know, after being scared, mm-hmm. but I was, you know, our high school had gone through a lot, just gaining reputation um, and respect in, in the community by mm-hmm. rising to the point where we were state champions in something. Mm -hmm. And then walking home that night, it kind of stripped all of the dignity and prestige of that away. Mm -hmm. And I was just another black fool walking the streets. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't lose it. You know, I got all that back. And, and, you know, we finished third in the outdoor track meet and our high school was ranked nationally in some of the times that we had. So we, I left that high school having helped it establish dignity, Mm -hmm. but I can't say that there wasn't a price. And I had, I have a little bit of change in that game. Mm -hmm. What, what just disheartened me so much, you know, was the, the other part of that story, you know, coming home from winning this this amazing you know series of awards and being state champs and everything you guys couldn't even go to a restaurant to celebrate right oh that part yeah on the way home you know our track coach who was white and jewish but you know we had a small bus that we were taking home we had to stop at three restaurants before one of them would let us in because we were an all-black team he was Mr. Slaymaker was his name. He was in tears after he left the first two before we finally, you know, were allowed to come in the third one. I think what and he tells that he, he would tell that story. He's passed on now, but he would tell that story as one of the lowest moments in his life that was that came shortly after the highest moment in his life when he finally had his first state champion team. Mm hmm. 
Well, and it's the um, the reality of living with accomplish accomplishing something that you work very hard for, um, and then having no recognition of your worth um, right. as a human being. I mean, we talked about it in the last. Uh, afternoon at the museum with the Tuskegee Airmen and all their accomplishments in the theater, the war theater abroad. And then you come home and you're, you know, leaving the ship and there's a whites only group that goes one direction and someone pointing to another direction for them after all they've done and all this, there's, they were celebrated abroad and come home to that. And you guys, track teams and swim teams, um, all kinds of- Debate clubs. Yeah, people yeah. accomplishing all that they did only to be told no, no, no restaurant seating for you. Yeah, your water fountain's over there. Your bathroom is over there. Um, in the movie Hidden Figures, you know, there's a piece of the movie that, and the book that talks about their bathroom, Colors Only Bathroom was a good mile, uh, maybe a mile, a mile and a half from where the women worked on the campus uh, of NASA. And uh, just the absurdity, I think is the word that comes to mind of racism is, um, I'm at a loss for words, but I think the, the museum here today that we visited helps us to better understand this country's history. Um, it is real in this history of ours as a country. I mean, if we're gonna be candid, it has been glossed over, um, parts left out for convenience, um, clock turned back because you know certain individuals in power didn't want other people to have an opportunity a simple opportunity, you know? And I was born in a time and place where I didn't experience the discrimination of, of what Paul, what you just mentioned, that just didn't happen for me uh, in my life. Where I am on the continuum of discrimination is the more subtle type of discrimination that you get um, either in your college, university, or even the workplace where people say absurd things like you have three strikes against you, Stephanie, you're a black blind woman. And um, I'm thankful for the parents and family I had because I was never instructed to accept that kind of conversation as legitimate. Um, and you can respectfully disagree with people and which is what I did in my workplace with that kind of comment. And so, I think we're at a point now where we just need to rip the bandage off, get uncomfortable and reconcile some of this history so that we can heal as a country. You said that better. Yeah. Now I'm gonna bring up a, a topic here before we, we go. Um, we have kind of two tracks here. You both are black, but you also are blind. Now, how does the civil rights struggle of people of color kind of parallel that disability struggle in your mind? Well, my comment would be very closely, um, you know, talking about, you know, Stephanie's comment about having, you know, three strikes. Um, somebody told me I had four <laughs> because, you know, by the, when I got back, I was a blind black Vietnam veteran, okay? And uh, not just a veteran, but a Vietnam veteran, baby mm -hmm. killer and all that other stuff. Yeah, yeah all yeah. the things that we forget that you all right. were called and had yeah. to go through yeah. when right. coming home. And, and so, you know, it, 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 that argument has been launched in several conversations you know, with several standards that are demeaning buried within it. Mm -hmm. But bottom line, they try to list, you know, quite frankly for us, how many things are wrong with us? 
how many things are inferior about us? Mm -hmm. How many things we need to be, we, we need to regret, you know, given that we're alive and, and, and that kind of thing. And it's all part of the structure, the fabric that is, 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 is covers up their feelings, mm -hmm. you know, because they try to say something profound mm -hmm. and they've actually said something that is, you know, devil based. Yeah. Okay. And, and they try to, you know, make it sound like it was sage wisdom that they gave us. It wasn't that it was straight out an insult. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Once again, it takes away what we are and, and they want to make us focus on what we are not. Mm -hmm. well, it, 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 it's couched in all this inspirational language. Right. Oh, aren't you wonderful for rising above all that? No, I am all that. Well, yeah, I am. It doesn't, it doesn't um, you know, in my perspective, Janine, in terms of the question, the intersectionality of black and blind is um, a, I say a, a double struggle because even within the community of blind individuals, you have racism, um, sadly. Um, and I, and I, I understand racism isn't based just on what people can see. I know there's prejudice and implicit bias and things like that. I just mm -hmm. find it again, astounding. Um, the, the prejudice, the racism, um, among blind individuals um, where our disability really should be front and center of our advocacy, not to take away from um, our, um, our advocacy as black individuals, but honestly, um, the, the prejudice, I think is just, um, I, I, I lose words because I don't understand it. And then I tell myself, you know what? Um, I'm going to pick the priorities for my advocacy because if I spend too much time trying to be a psychologist and I'm not, um, I'm just gonna lose my place with the real work that lies ahead, which is advocacy for people of color, for women. Um, and, um, and for people with disabilities. And, and, and for people with disabilities, um, blind is just a part of who I am as I like to call myself a black American of African descent because I may not know the country of origin in Africa. It's a large continent, 54 countries at last check. Um, so I don't know which one I or originated from, but I'm pretty certain I originated from one. So I'm a black American of African descent, and pr I'm proud to say it that way. And a blind black woman um, involved in advocacy um, for blindness uh, and black uh, causes and, and people of color causes. I mean, we have a lot of allies and we have a lot of work to be done. So I choose not to focus so much on the prejudice and the bias of people and more focus on how can we make this a better place. And again, I say one thing to do is just be, let's just get to know this history. Let's have these candid conversations. Thank you, Janine, for opening up this forum for that. I don't know what kind of comments you're getting on YouTube or in Zoom, but I hope to always have people be civil and respectful, even if they don't understand, or even if they disagree. But the history needs to be told and understood so we can heal and move forward as a country. Absolutely. Right. And uh, please know that Ira stands with you, whatever we can do, you know, yes. and whatever, you know, all of us can do together here. One of the things that you as Ira customers can do through the end of the year is take advantage of our museum offer. And this offer allows you to get with an agent and take a look at the list of museums that are members of the African Association of African American Museums. And those can be found at blackmuseums.org slash directory. Now, they may still be redoing their websites or some of the links may not work to the individual museums. But if you ask your agent, we have a list 
and we can help you look at any of these that you want from any aspect. Um, there are a number of really amazing places from artwork, if you are into art, for music, uh, for history, um, schools. Uh, there are a lot of websites that have to do with the segregated schools that were out there uh, mm -hmm. and historical sites like that. So there is just so much information out there, um, both very current and, and involving things, you know, long, long ago. So uh, we want you to make use of that and, uh, you know, educate yourself and take part in some of these conversations. Coming up, our next afternoon at the museum will be, and I have to switch hands here to grab my braille calendar, but our next event will be in October, believe it or not. And I'm not quite sure where we're gonna be yet, but um, that will be on Friday, October the 9th. So Friday, October the 9th, save the spot uh, and Stay tuned to Ira because next week, a whole big piece of this civil rights struggle of all of the things that we have been talking about in this country for the past, well, since time began, I think, but especially in sharp focus over the past six months has been about voting. Mm -hmm. We have an election. We have a very critical election coming up regardless of which side you're on. And voting and having access to voting information is crucial. And if we read and research back about Jim Crow, a lot of those laws prevented Black people, any minority, uh, Native Americans, anybody from voting. Mm -hmm. And that really, really inhibited things, you know, in terms of local uh, ability to move forward and ability to realize equality for everybody. Well, yeah. let's not let that happen in 2020, folks. We'll be yeah. coming to you live with an announcement about the voting promo that will be coming up. So on October 1st, everyone, get excited and get ready because we will uh, have a, a short live YouTube session about that coming up on that day when that voting promo goes live. From Ira, this has been Janine Stanley, your Explorer Community Manager, here with my technical guy, Ryan Bishop. Thank Ryan you so much, Ryan. I'm just, the, I'm just the background manager today. That's the, you know. He's and, just the background and, guy. and it's such a pleasure. Um, gosh, what, a, what an hour. Uh, yeah. And what a what an experience and I, I I really do look forward to the next one on October the 9th. It's so uh, so great to get to learn all this history and to, to be a part of really what we uh, what people have experienced back then. I think it really does open up a lot of uh, a lot of you know especially getting to, to see it. I, I think Stephanie said it great earlier that you know we can we can go to these museums, we can even look at the websites, but getting to view this from an IRA agent um, and getting to see the pictures in clearer detail or getting those quote unquote thousand words uh, in several words uh, from a description <laughs> is yeah. definitely uh, yeah. an eye opening experience. So I really do enjoy these and I'm so glad to be a part of it and to. Uh, and thanks to Kayla. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, was, Thank you, Kayla. It was my pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> See, I got more than a thousand words, so I, I like I, any chance I got to spill them. <laughs> you read about 2,000. <laughs> no, awesome, awesome reading, describing, catching things on the fly, yeah, just know. doing doing what IRA agents do so well. So, well, thank thank you, so fascinating, Caleb, mm -hmm. to have heard the descriptions of Dr. King and and how he looked. He those, was very omniscient, I think, about what was coming. Yeah. You know, yeah. from it, was, the, it definitely stood out. Like like he he always had like in or at least in the pictures they 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 chose to show. Like he definitely had a different look compared to mm -hmm. everybody else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Maybe. So interesting to know and mm -hmm. to get that so experience. Love the timeline. Thank you for finding that. Absolutely. Yeah, of course. And finally, a very special thanks to our host, Stephanie Watts. Thank you so much, Stephanie, and our special guest, Mr. Paul Mims. No, thank you. Thank you, Paul. I was honored <laughs> to be part of this. Trust me.
to whoever won. Awesome. And we will, Paul, will be back with us when we do baseball. So never fear, baseball will be coming, folks. My last Wonderful. chance to hit a home run, right? <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Now, what you, what, uh, those of you out there uh, who may not be able to see it, what you don't know is Paul is wearing his Kansas City Chiefs hat right now. Um, and, no, you took uh, that off in the beginning. No, <laughs> no I didn't. <laughs> but of course he didn't. Yeah. <laughs> and Stephanie has on her uh, MLK mm -hmm. shirt today. So mm -hmm. yeah, we are, we are prepared. We are looking good. Yeah. Well, everyone have a wonderful weekend and a wonderful couple weeks until we see you here again at Afternoon at the Museum.